right, you guys, thank you so much for joining me. My name is Michelle Hearn and I'm a registered and licensed dietitian. And this is the Dietitian's Dilemma, where we discuss the nutrition guidelines and mm, how they may not be the best to follow for everybody. We talk about more primal, ancestral, low carb, ketogenic, and carnivore diets. And today, you guys, I am super excited to have one of my RD heroes on. This is Diana Rogers. Diana, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. This is amazing. So, um, for someone who hasn't heard about you, maybe they've been living under a rock. Can you give us just kind of a brief background of yeah. um, who you are and what your what your mission is? Yeah, and I and I hope my upcoming book is a requirement for RDs moving forward. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Too. Um, <laughs> uh, I, my name is Diana Rogers and I'm also a registered dietitian. I have a clinical practice in, um, Concord, Massachusetts. And I also have just finished a book and documentary film about the topic of red meat and why, um, why had red meat has been scapegoated as, you know, Ooh, I just knocked my microphone bad <laughs> yeah. for the bad for the uh, planet, bad for your health and unethical to eat. And I really dive into all of those things in the book and the film um, and really question, you know, the sustainability aspect. Can we do this at scale? Really all the questions that people have about um, cattle in particular. Um, I'm a huge believer in animal products. I don't think everyone needs to be necessarily eating beef, um, but I do think that animal products are critical for humans to thrive. And um, the reason why I'm focusing on, you know, cow, sacred cow, is because beef tends to be the most vilified, right? Med red meat is, it's like the third rail of nutrition. Red meat is, um, you know, everyone loves a cow. They look a lot like uh, dogs, uh, big eyes, you know, people seem to think that, you know, fish or chicken are like cleaner to eat, uh, in some ways, cause they're white meat, they're less bloody looking. There's a lot of reasons for that. It's more feminine to eat, um, chicken and fish. Um, whenever I'm out with my husband and he orders a salad and I order a steak, they always bring me the salad and we swap <laughs> them out. Um, and there's just a lot of misinformation floating around environmentally and um, nutritionally about red meat. So, um, so even though fish is probably my my favorite um, animal product to eat, um, I really felt that red meat needed to be vindicated. Wow, that's that's awesome. And so, you know, that's you bring up a really good point because certainly as a dietitian, you know, I was taught and I was trained that. Um, you know, we really need to keep our saturated fat intake low. Keeping saturated fat low is very important for your heart health. Low fat is very good. And, you know, as I've been a clinical dietitian, well, I've been a dietitian for 11 years. You know, I've been mm -hmm. a clinical dietitian for a bit less than that. Um, you know, as I've seen us lower our saturated fat intake, you know, we know as a nation since the 1970s, we are eating quite a bit less beef. You know, we are, like you said, we're eating more chicken and we're even eating more um, oils, you know, more seed oils. Yeah. Um, and we're eating more whole grains. So just like the nutrition pyramid told us, we're eating more healthy whole grains. Yep. So as a, as a, you know, the public is doing more what we're supposed to do. What I've seen in, you know, my practice is people are getting significantly sicker. Diabetes is off the charts. Um, you know, heart disease is off the charts, uh, dementia, all these other things. So why, what is it about beef? Like, why do you think, why do you think one, do you think it's actually good for us? And two, why do you think, you know, you, you, you alluded to a little bit, but why do you think it's been so vilified? Yeah. So, um, you know, we're facing a lot of quandaries right now. Um, we, we see everyone's health failing. We see the environmental destruction from our agricultural systems. Um, we see dramatic images of animal abuse, um, in our industrial food system. All of those things are legitimately not okay. And I am 100% on board with that. I'm actually on the board um, of Animal Welfare Approved, which is kind of the gold standard of um, animal treatment, animal welfare on, with farmed animals. Um, and so, and, and I raise animals here on the farm that I live on, but it is primarily an organic vegetable farm. And um, the reason, the primary reason we raise animals isn't to make a lot of money. It's actually for the nutrients that we need in order to grow kale and tomatoes and carrots and things like that. So um, we actually require animals as, our, as part of the ecosystem of any sustainable farm. You absolutely cannot have a food system that doesn't include animals. Um, but as, as we've 
you know, gotten further away from food production. We, we understand it less and less, and there's more polarization happening between rural and urban people, vegans and meat eaters. I mean, we've just, you know, we can see in our political cycle, we've just become completely polarized and the conversations have gotten really simplistic and really, you know, one way or the other, black and white, uh, meat, no meat, things like that. Um, and what I'm trying to do with the Sacred Cow Project is introduce some nuance and say like, yes, we can all agree that our industrial food system is ruining the environment, that animal abuse is not okay, that um, humans need to be eating healthy foods, but we can disagree on what those healthy foods are and what is the most sustainable, you know, healthiest food system moving forward. And, you know, sh if we want to change the meat system, is it eliminate meat or is it actually make it better? And I, I don't think that opting out of the system is actually going to change the system. I think that, um, you know, what we see is that most people that go vegetarian or vegan, 85% of them go back to eating meat within one year. Um, wow. So although... Um, it appears that some people are doing okay on a vegan diet. Um, I think there's a lot of reasons for that. You know, usually when someone goes vegan, they're eliminating processed foods. They're making some other life choices um, for the better. They're joining a cause, which makes them feel good, makes them feel part of a community. Those are all really important things. Um, but similarly, when someone goes paleo, that tends to happen as well. They might join a CrossFit, so they've got their community, they're working out more, they're also eliminating processed foods. And when we look at the data against red meat and look at all the benefits of red meat, there's actually no reason to be eliminating animal products from your diet. There's no difference in longevity when you eliminate all those confounding factors, smoking and drinking, and you know, really just look at you know, people of a similar healthy lifestyle that um, are either vegetarian or omnivore, there's no difference in longevity at all between a vegetarian and someone who's an omnivore. And what we know is that there are nutrients, you know, whole foods nutrients that you can only get in animal products. Um, and not everyone is going to be taking supplements. Not everyone has access to be taking supplements. There's places in the world where there's not a CVS or a Walgreens around the corner to get your B12 supplements, where, you know, tofu and grain production is not possible because the land is either too rocky, too hilly, too brittle, you know, not enough irrigation to be cropping. Um, and so to have these worldwide recommendations that we should all just blanketly be reducing our meat intake um, is actually a social justice issue for me. And I think that um, we really need to be looking at food equity and, um, and thinking about, you know, what diet is going to help people thrive the best, and then how can we produce that in a more sustainable way? That is amazing. When you said there was, a, well, there's two things you said. I mean, the very last thing you said is absolutely you know, I think key. But then when you said that there are certain things we can only get in the animal community, <laughs> I wanted to be like louder for the people in the back. Um, I think we do a very poor job as dietitians. And this is something that I was not necessarily taught as a dietitian that I, you know, through research and through looking at the clinical trials and the data, um, just because a product has a certain amount of protein or a certain amount of vitamin A, let's say a carrot has this much vitamin A, you know, if you looked, if you have vitamin A, a yeah, exactly. <laughs> in a carrot, <laughs> it, has, it has that, um, that doesn't mean that is the amount that your body can utilize and absorb. Right? Yes. And, and like, especially with um, vitamin A. Yes. Because in plants, it's in the form of beta carotene. It's not true vitamin A retinol that humans need. And about 45% of all humans lack the um, genetic ability to actually make that conversion efficiently. And so there you've got about half of, a, of, of all humans that would not do well on a, a plant-based only diet because they would be vitamin A deficient. And I mean, and that's one example. B12 is another really powerful example. Um, and I think also if we're looking at, you know, I, I've done some other YouTubes where we talked quite a bit about brain health. Then we talked about the importance of EPA and DHA. And I've um, had people talk to me about in the vegan community, they say, well, we can get, you know, ALA and that can transition. And unfortunately, the clinical trials show that that transition is very poor. The numbers are actually zero to maybe 10% is like the top of the top, you know? And so from animal foods, it's significantly, significantly higher. So there we go. You know, when we're eating the animal foods, we have that, you know, that fat and that saturated fat for our brain health. Um, and yeah, and I think the very last thing you said, so 
I think for for social for social justice and for social equity, we say, okay, I think the best thing to say is like, how can we produce food for people that is going to nourish people so they can live like their best, most full lives and is going to take care of the planet? Because those, I don't think those can, um, you know, not exist together. I think we've had people that have really good intentions, um, but you know, a lot of people say, okay, well, I, I hear you. I mean, I like meat. I've kind of enjoyed the taste, but it's bad for the environment. I've heard it's bad for the environment. And this is where, you know, obviously, hopefully anybody who watches my YouTube, we're all critical thinkers. So when we hear something, we like to go and do some research on it. We don't just blindly believe things. But could you speak just a little bit to that? I know you have the poster behind you. Yes, I've got this beautiful cattle carbon cycle poster behind me. And um, uh, I just wanted to real quick, just touch back um, on the social justice piece, because this is something that um, is really important to me. And there's this concept called food sovereignty. And that is everyone's right to eat culturally appropriate, nourishing food grown in a healthy way. Um, and so when we have people going around demanding that others give up meat, which is a culturally appropriate food for pretty much every single culture that exists. Um, and even in the vegetarian cultures, we see a lot of animal intake um, happening. So, uh, and a lot of, a lot of animal production. I mean, vegetarian India is only possible because of Muslim meat eaters, because what are you going to do with those cows that you've been milking once they're too old to be milked? Um, so, uh, so food sovereignty is something that needs to be honored with all cultures. And, um, uh, we absolutely can't have a bunch of, you know, I, I went to this uh, event at Harvard a few years ago called Just Food, and it was all about this. And um, I watched uh, a Latina woman speaking who's actually become a really good friend of mine. And she was saying, that, you know, the last thing we need is skinny white girls going around to farmer's markets telling us to eat more salad. And I... <laughs> You know, when you think of a typical dietitian, that's what it is. You know, that's the stereotype is a, is a skinny white girl going around telling people to eat salad um, when, you know, what we really need to nourish people is not salad. Um, you know, lettuce is not a super nutrient dense food. It is per calorie. But um, when you look at how many calories worth of lettuce that you're actually getting in a salad, it's not that much. Um, if you, if we want to feed people who are food insecure, we need to give them animal products, um, because that's going to be the best way to deliver important nutrients to people who are hungry or food insecure. So I just wanted to kind of harp on that a little bit, because I don't think many people are, um, really addressing meat from a food sovereignty, social justice perspective. And it needs to uh, be. No, I totally agree with you. I've noticed during, we're, we're filming this, um, you guys during the, the COVID pandemic, and I've, I, um, I've noticed that a lot of the food banks, a lot of people are, you know, well-meaning bringing food to food bank, but I've seen people with lots of like boxes of cereals and granola bars and things like that. And unfortunately, like you said, we tend to, um, people who need food, they really need that nutrient dense food, which a lot of times isn't those, um, you know, processed carbohydrates and those kind of empty calories, but that tends to be what, you know, people that don't have a lot of financial resources or lower so socioeconomic status, where when in reality, we need to be feeding them the meat, the, you know, fish, the things that actually have that protein, that amino acids. And um, a little later on, we can get into, you know, that mental health and other things like that. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I hear you on that point. Right. And so just because um, the majority of meat in this, um, in our culture is not grown in a fantastic way, it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to eat less. Um, I mean, that would be like a doctor telling their patients, you know, uh, eat organic vegetables or don't eat vegetables. We all need to be eating less vegetables because there's not that many organic vegetables on the market. A doctor would never say that. A dietitian certainly would never say that to a client, um, you know, if, if they could digest vegetables, you know, unless there's a reason why certain vegetables aren't ideal for that person. Um, and so I just think we need as dietitians to be very careful about this assumption that everyone's eating too much meat and we necessarily be, need to be eating less meat because, um, the typical American is only eating about two ounces of beef per person per day. And that's, that's not too much. I think there's this perception that, you know, everyone's sitting down to a 72 ounce tomahawk steak every night, like a big fl Fred Flintstone club of meat. And that's actually not the reality of what's happening. And so, um, you know, we need to be looking at what is the optimal diet for humans and then how can we produce that in a sustainable way. But unfortunately, the dialogue right now is, 
well, what is a sustainable, what is the most sustainable thing we're growing currently? And, um, you know, how can we feed that to the masses? And, um, you know, we don't have a food production problem in, in the world. We have, uh, we produce many more calories than we actually need to be eating. We have a nutrient problem. We have a protein problem. Um, yeah, so. no, I, I totally agree. And you know, what's, what's interesting is that the longer I've been in the hospital, the more I've seen, um, people who are, and you even see this in our elderly community, you see a sarcopenic obesity, but you see yes. people who are so obese, but they are actually massively malnourished. You know, people mm -hmm. who are so, have so much weight that they, but they have so little muscle mass that they can't actually, um, you know, even, even sit up or stand up without, without assistance. You know, I, um, with a kind of inspiration from you're writing a book, I'm, st I'm starting to write my own book about four different areas in the hospital I've seen. And one, one is, you know, is sarcopenia. And I just think it's a tragedy that our seniors, you know, our, our the recommendations for protein for the RDA is so low. It's so are, low. You know, so yes. low. And those are actually apparently for 18 year old healthy adults just to like d not die, not, not thrive. Just uh -huh. not die. In our, our elderly community, we know they don't synthesize and utilize protein as well. And yes. we also know when they eat more, you know, um, nutrient low foods, they're replacing protein with other like, you know, process things and that um, they actually have higher protein needs. But yes. so I think it's a tragedy that we've kind of like discouraged them. Like the worst thing you could do for your, your parent or your grandparent is to be like, oh, hey, let's have, you know, this, this soy patty or this mashed potatoes instead of the actual nutrition. But I've gone into many elderly rooms and they're like, Oh, don't worry. You know, I didn't order the burger. I ordered pasta, you know, yeah. so people are, there's a lot of misconception going on. And I also think I'd be really curious because I do want to talk about the environment, but yes, uh, what is your, well, I do your think nutrition is, is the best thing to get out of the way though, because once we're all on board with the fact that um, animal products are healthy, then we can move on to the environmental concerns and how could we potentially change our agriculture system to be um, more, you know, cattle friendly yeah. and how can cattle actually benefit the land. So I, I can address that, but I, I agree as a dietitian. Um, I mean, sarcopenia for your folks that don't know what that is very serious. It's, it's the leading reason why people fall. Um, and, uh, it's age related muscle loss and, um, and eating less protein and not lifting weights is how it happens. Um, and so that's why I get nervous too about, um, the idea that we need to be eating a uh, restricting protein for longevity, um, because that's just BS in my opinion, what we need to be doing instead of worrying about not dying, we need to be worrying about living well, um, and living in a strong way and, uh, not just uh, number of years equals success. Um, so it's not just about longevity folks. It's about, um, actually, being healthy for those years that you're around. And um, absolutely, uh, our seniors, our kids um, need way more protein. The RDA, I actually looked into the origins of the RDA and the protein recommendations. And um, first of all, they're based on really shaky science. They're based on these nitrogen balance studies, which are pretty bogus and don't take into account the satiating quality of protein. Protein is, fills you up more than any other macronutrient. Um, and it also doesn't take into account the other benefits of, of protein sort of offsetting, um, you know, because it's so satiating, then offsetting um, the other intakes that you would take from um, carbs and from fat. And so, um, you know, when people hear that women only need 45 grams of protein a day and men only need 54 grams of protein a day, those are actually based on, you know, uh, a, a ideal weight of women at 125 pounds and ideal weight of men at 154 pounds. And so I don't weigh 125 pounds. I'm a very healthy person. Um, I don't know many women who do weigh 125 pounds. Um, so at the very minimum, I think, you know, on a 2000 calorie diet, if we're looking at, um, a very conservative 20% of calories from protein, that's a 100 grams of protein per person per day. If they're taking in, um, 2000 calories, that's about double our RDA for protein. And that's about double what people are currently eating. Yeah, and that's and and specifically the elderly community. The statistics, yeah. you know, are they actually getting that bare minimum protein? It's not good. Exactly. You know, really, unfortunately, not not good. And you know, what's really interesting is there is a, I mean, there's so much misinformation around protein, and like you said, specifically at red meat, that people become afraid. You know, and 
Um, you know, like my personal story as a long distance runner, I've, I've been doing marathons, you know, for the last 12 years, I qualified for Boston 12 times. And I just started having so much muscle pain and I had cut down my protein intake pretty significantly in order to bump up my carbohydrates. And so I was consuming, you know, 350, 400 grams of carbohydrates, eating just a very little bit of lean protein. Um, if anybody who doesn't know, that's a, that's a pretty significant amount of carbohydrates. And, you know, I just felt awful and everything I was reading though, from, you know, sports nutrition that I just needed all this sugar and all this. And so I decided to really take a step back and do some research. And when I, when I came across more of like the, the paleo diet and carnivore diet and ketogenic diet, it seemed to make sense that our human physiology, and I know this is one of your points, is um, designed to eat meat. You know, it really, we really, our, our GI system, our, our um, stomach acid is 1.5. It's very acidic. You know, we have very small cecums. We have um, relatively, compared to other animals, a smaller, um, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? intestines like length of intestines and our body does a very good job of utilizing and taking out those nutrients the the zinc the folate the b12 the the, the fat soluble vitamins and i was like that's so interesting because i've been really restricting these things so i wanted to just kind of see like well i wonder if i add these things back in like my only goal was i just want my muscle pain to go away you know and i knew mm -hmm. protein had lots of functions in the body and so i just decided for a couple of weeks i would just really pound the red meat you know i'm gonna um, and as you can imagine, as a dietitian working in a hospital, I, I was a little weird having red meat first thing in the morning and a big thing at lunch and, you know, eating a lot of meat and fat, you know, for a very short period of time, I was like, I'm going to go completely ketogenic, high meat, high fat. And it completely shifted how I viewed nutrition because, you know, I was, I was afraid. I was like, this is going to be terrible, but maybe just for a short period of time. And what I found was not only was my energy stable, my mental health improved, my muscle pain was gone. And one thing you talked about specifically is I felt satiated. I mean, I could literally eat a thousand calories of a carbohydrate source and be hungry in a few hours mm -hmm. where I found that, that that meat not only allowed me to um, not be hungry, but I literally became, and this is not an exaggeration, anyone who's been viewing me or follows me knows this is true, I became a better human. Like I was, um, I was a better partner, I was a better employee, I became, I was able to start running again. So I'm just, I, I'm almost now angry at this misconception. And as you have you said, it's based on really poor science. A lot of it's still based on some of the, the terrible um, studies from Ansel Keys and some of his assertions. So I, uh, I mean, I applaud you and I applaud the work that you're doing. I think we have a, a long way to go and kind of like, you know, chipping away at some of the misinformation. Um, but I just think it's kind of starting at that foundation that guy like, guys, we got to get back to meat. Like meat was never the problem. You know, if people were eating meat and fat for three and a half million years, with no chronic disease, basically completely absent. Then we add in a lot of processed foods, a lot of seed oils, and I'm sure a lot of pesticides. Diabetes goes through the roof, but then we're like, oh, it's the meat's fault. <laughs> right, right. Um, yes, and I have a similar story too. And I think, um, you know, once you're liberated from needing a snack every two hours, it's a pretty powerful change. Um, I mean, just that alone, you feel more uh, even keeled and, you know, you're not like, oh my God, is this meeting going to end soon because I'm dying? You know, like I remember yeah. that feeling of like starting to sweat if it, it yeah. had been more than like two hours since my last granola bar. Um, and, uh, and when I first, um, went, you know, paleo keto, um, gosh, about 12 years ago or so now, um, I, I just felt like I'm free. I'm totally free. Um, I can, you know, I can eat or not eat and I'm okay. And, um, that's, that's a real game changer in anyone's life, yeah. you know, whether or not they're actively suffering from something like depression, which we know can also be helped by, um, you know, eating more animal products. Yeah. Do you, um, and I want to talk about that next, but just why do you think the, the dietetics community is so, um, so afraid to shift our recommendations because we do have some really good clinical data about lowering carbohydrates can be very good for people with diabetes. We have some good clinical data that, you know, saturated fats in the absence of hyperglycemia has no negative impact on heart disease. So it would make sense to me that, okay, with all this, and we're seeing, you know, we're, we're, it's like the definition of insanity. We can't keep doing the same thing and expect chronic disease to switch, shift. Mm -hmm. So what do you think is some of the major um, barriers to change? Well, um, I don't know if you know this, but the dietitian profession actually came from the Seventh-day Adventists. So the first dietitian was a Seventh-day Adventist. Did you know that? Um, yeah. Uh, so was the first nurse. Um, 
and very so about getting our medical advice from religious organizations. Right? Yes, Sorry. and proceed, so this is proceed. this is based on a woman that had these visions from God that uh, meat, along with alcohol and spices and um, caffeine, uh, all of these things would make you have more lustful desires. And so if we wanted to be pure in the eyes of God, we needed to um, refrain from eating meat. Um, and it would kind of tamper your uh, sexual desires. And that was that was the thinking behind the beginning of the dietetics movement. And so, um, you know, even the 1980 position statement from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics uh, talking about vegan and vegetarian diets, um, or maybe at the time in 1980, it was just the vegetarian diets, but um, everyone on that panel was a vegetarian that was writing that. And so this is it's not just a, a way of eating. It's actually a whole ethic, right? Of, um, you know, not believing that meat is okay to be eating. It's not really science-based. It's more, you know, emotionally driven. Um, and so that's, that's driving a lot. Um, we also see um, Walter Willett at Harvard, who is a sort of Mr. Dietary Guidelines, um, really pushing his observational research um, where he's inserting his bias against me into the research findings. Um, and interestingly, I did interview him for the film and um, have a great quote from him saying, you know, farmers have known for thousands of years, if you want to fatten up an animal, you um, put them in a, a pen where they can't move too much and you feed them lots of grain. And humans are like that too. He literally wow. said that. I have a release signed from him it will be in my film coming up. So, um, but if any of you know, uh, the Walter Willett's whole uh, platform is basically meat is bad. Um, he is coming around on the fat issue. I did talk to him a little bit about ketogenic diets and he his position was that um, plant-based ketogenic diets um, could be a therapeutic tool. And when I was walking through the halls of the Harvard School of Public Health, I did see, um, pro plant-based keto papers that were stuck to the wall. Um, so I think the fat thing is actually coming around. I think, um, you know, that's sort of, you know, going away and in its place has, is now the focus is red meat. Um, cause not only is it, um, you know, thought to be bad for obesity, heart disease, cancer, diabetes. I, I don't understand how, you know, a, a protein source can be bad for diabetes. Um, uh, it is also, you know, highly unethical to kill beautiful animals and um, bad for the environment. All right, you guys, my name is Michelle Hearn and I'm a registered and licensed dietitian. Thank you so much for watching part one of our two part series. So now stay tuned for the rest of the story. Mm -hmm.